Hello, tea friends. Welcome to our live broadcast. Nice to meet you here in the virtual realms. Today's going to be a little different, unfortunately, for both of us because there's a lot of questions. So we're going to not have so much time. We can't spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes sitting and drinking tea in silence. Um, which sucks because you're just going to have to listen to me blabber and not have some <clears throat> real tea shared together. And uh, <clears throat> so I apologize for that. So uh, we're just going to we're just going to get started. If, there's a lot of questions here that people asked before the broadcast. And I also want to maybe leave space for uh, those of you who are joining to ask questions. And I also want to uh, talk about something that it's, well, it came in the form of a question, but uh, is more really of a topic that I kind of want to just uh, throw out there in terms of discussion and exploration. I view all these conversations in that way, not like I really have answers, you know, people asking questions. And, you know, sometimes if it's a, if it's a little fact, you know, like where does, <clears throat> what province is Wu in, for example, then I do have an answer. I can say Fujian. So if it's some kind of factoid, then I may or may not have the answer. Other times there's questions just asking for my experience. And then, you know, you can gather and use that experience and strength and hope and, and, uh, and uh, maybe be inspired or have, find some guidance in it. But more... I like to regard these conversations as questions, as questions that resolve into questions so that we all continue to seek and, and grow and explore together. That's more um, where I'm coming from. And that brings me to the topic that I really wanted to discuss, first of all, today, um, which came up in a conversation with a tea buddy, and uh, he had asked the question, and, and kind of um, also asked me to discuss it the next in a, in a video we had talked about even making a, a video just about this topic. And then I realized that the live broadcast was coming up. So I thought I would just make his question kind of <clears throat> the first question of the broadcast and kind of launch into this topic. And again, just to open a dialogue, open a conversation and, and explore a lot of it, a lot of it together. But the question that he asked and the discussion that we had was about the, the approaches to tea. So he um, is uh, more recently gotten interested in tea, and um, in the last year or two. And he, uh, you know, like most humans, when we're interested in something, right, you start exploring on the internet, and then you have to kind of slog through the quagmire of of the internet and which is a, both an extremely rewarding journey and also fraught with peril as well of all, all different kinds. So in that, he, 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 he came with this question about like what he saw as like hard lines between, between tea approaches. And he asked me to talk about that. And then once we talked about it together for a little bit, 
um, it just he he said you should make a video about this. You should we should you should talk about this publicly. So uh, that that's why I think it's a it's a good topic to start this broadcast and start this discussion. So going back a long time, there have been for just the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to separate them this way. There have been three approaches to tea. And there are three approaches to tea in the world today. There's tea as beverage. And then the second approach is, is, is tea as connoisseur. And then the third would be like ceremonialist. And these first two are akin to a lot of things. They're akin to like food in the sense that you can, you can just, you know, cook a meal and, and just make, you know, make some good healthy food for yourself for lunch and not worry about it too much. And you can approach food that way in general. Or you can refine your ability to select ingredients and to put them together and prepare, you know, what we could distinguish from meals as cuisine. And, uh, and that would be connoisseurship. And then ceremonialism, you know, is more you're moving into, you could say, like spirituality, uh, religion. And as time has moved forward, these first two have become much more predominant. But as you travel and follow the trails of T's history back, it's, it leads to the second two. And eventually, actually, if you go back far enough, it leads only to the, to the ceremony. So it is a fact that all, all tea consumption begins in religion, in spirituality. Um, and then as we come forward in time, there's more of these, of these other things. And the first thing that I'd like to say about these, though it may seem like it because human beings are human beings and, and we're passionate. Um, we're passionate about what we do, you know, especially these, these, this middle one and the third one. It may seem as if these are somehow mutually exclusive, but they're not. I, I consume tea in all these ways, sometimes in the same day. Um, you know, you can put tea in a, in a mug and you can, and while you work or in a thermos when you go out. And then there's something to the, like, you know, the geekery and, and I love for, for quality and a love for refinement and a re love for uh, making better and better tea. Finding uh, and making tea means also sourcing better tea and making it in a better way, preparing it, et cetera, and l learning all that. And then, you know, ceremony as well. So these are, these are not mutually exclusive. And it may seem, you know, somebody in this, for lack of a better word, camp, you know, somebody whose tea is a beverage to them, they might look and say like, oh, those connoisseurs are, snooty and, and, and making a tempest out of a teacup. They're, they're, this is snobby. And those ceremonialists are just weird, flat out weirdos, uh, which, you know, there's, there's truth in that. And the connoisseurs might look at the beverage people and say like, oh, you know, you're, you're not getting the most out of your tea. You don't, you're missing out. You, you da, 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 da. And they might then turn and say, you guys are, yeah, I agree with them. You guys are weirdos. <laughs> and then these people might be like, well, without spiritual practice, my life would, would be missing so much. You two are missing. And like the, it becomes, uh, I'm not saying there's any kind of like hard lines here, but sometimes, you know, human beings get stuck and, and we, we, uh, we don't, we can forget to regard other views and other ways w with curiosity, with openness and, and receptivity. And, in, and instead, we, you know, especially when you're passionate, you can start to get passionate about this, passionate about this, passionate about this. And then passion comes in and it makes it, my friend said, like he was just saying, this whole conversation began because he was commenting on it. It, it, it seems like these tracks are like isolated from each other. And um, for me, that's not so. I feel like um, I, I, could, I could very much connect with, with somebody who drinks tea as a beverage. I have friends like that. Um, and family members, actually. Um, and, you know, connoisseur, like, oh, dude, we'll geek out all day long. I love it. We'll, we'll chat about teapots and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And, of course, for me, I, I'm more here. I, I like ceremony um, and what it brings to my life. So um, I think I, 
I nestle there the most. That's what's, I guess, primary for me. But I don't feel like, I don't feel like nothing but love for all these people. Anyone who loves tea, um, you know, I, we could be friends and uh, we can connect. And there's a lot, actually, that we can learn from each other, actually. Um, if you think about it, maybe, you know, the, the connoisseur could, could, could actually improve their tea with a little bit of the mindfulness practices that come from ceremony. And, and the beverage people probably would enjoy their tea more if they adapted a little bit of technique. And, and the ceremonialists might, you know, they could benefit from not taking themselves so seriously or their practice so seriously and relax a little bit and chill out and allow uh, a little bit of that, like material appreciation, sensual appreciation to come, come in and flow in. We all also, the, the main common thing between all of these approaches to tea is it's, is it's the, way of the love of this leaf. And so for me, I think the biggest thing that we share in common, the biggest conversation that I want to have with people coming from different approaches that, that approach tea differently than me, whether you approach it as a beverage or you approach it at, from a connoisseur level and you really appreciate it, or whether you approach it as a ceremony, no matter how you approach tea, I think the, the most important conversation is the impact that that tea has on our health and on the health of the planet. Because, uh, you know, you can't, or to put it in the form of a question, how do you love a leaf and not love the forest? If it's a beverage, don't you want it to be a healthy beverage? Don't you want the, and by healthy, I mean healthy for your body, healthy for the, for the environment where it grows, and healthy for the farmers. And if you're a connoisseur, then you know that, uh, that tea is its environment. It is its terroir. The, the main, the main, we t in, the, in the modern uh, age, we tend to focus on processing method. We tend to industrialize tea. But actually, the environment is far more influential than the processing. Or at least agree with me that it's as influential. Right? It depends on the tea, really. Uh, but but it's, it's it at least half. Uh, of, and, and, I, and I would argue that in more cases, it's more than half the quality of a tea is its environment. And by quality, I don't just mean its quality this way, in terms of like how fine of a tea it is, but also its quality in terms of its distinction, its characteristics, what makes it uh, wu-yi tea is wu-yi, is that place. So a tea is its terroir, it is its environment. Um, it, you, don't ha you cannot find healthy organisms in an unhealthy environment. The fish that live in a polluted pond are also polluted. Their bodies are also polluted. So the connoisseur knows that the tea is its environment. And if you're the ceremonialist, then you, know, you have to think, like, I'm trying to cultivate, uh, you know, this is a tricky, and I, I'm for, for, I can get lost and, and, and revolve in anecdotes. I, I do believe that in some ways tea is aimless. But with that caveat aside, I'm trying to cultivate peace, let's say, let's just keep it simple and say peace, insight, wisdom, but also peace. And so you, you have to ask yourself, how do I cultivate peace when the instrument of that practice is, is destructive? So I think no matter what perspective you're coming from, this is the place where we can meet and have really important conversations um, about, essentially about the environmental impact of tea growing. Um, you know, and there is evidence of the, you know, the detriments to, to our health of like conventional agrochemicals. Also, you know, hundreds of thousands of humans are dying every year. You might not know this from pesticide exposure. So there's certainly a risk to the health of the farmers themselves who are exposed to these chemicals. Um, and then, of course, it damages the environment and, 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 it, and it then reduces the quality in terms of the connoisseur. I can't tell you how many times, you know, in Wui comes to mind, the late and great Master Huang, one of the most important tea people I've ever met in my life, and, you know, one of the greatest tea masters of the modern era, because tea masters are farmers, not weird dudes sitting around on YouTube talking about tea. <laughs> so, 
he, he, this tea master is, he, he, he often, I can remember him specifically, I've, I've experienced this at other farms and other mountains, but him specifically, you know, when the leaves came, come in, the first leaves of the season, and seeing that they're covered in bug bites, he would always say, good, it's good, it's a good year. Um, because he, he understood, and I, I'm, not just, um, I'm not just extrapolating this or interpreting, I, I actually asked him, right, um, at some point, in, in, you know, he, under, he understand or understood that, that uh, you know, if there's a lot of bug bites on the leaves, it means that the environment, the, the ecology is vibrant. It means the, because the insects also have predators, and so it means the whole thing is very vibrant. You have to remember when you chase away insects, you also chase away the things that eat those insects and the things that eat those things, and all of their poop and their dead bodies and the effect that it has on soil and chemistry and air and, you know, all kinds of amazing things. So the, those bug bites show him that the ecology is vibrant, that there's life, and that, that extends to a fufu level as well. You don't have to go to any fufu level. If you don't want to go to fufu level, you can just say that biodiversity is influential. Um, but <clears throat> there's a fufu level of like that, the spirit of all that life. You know, when, when you go out in nature, and there's a difference between going into like a really sterile, uh, manicured garden and, uh, and, a, and a wild place where living things are living out their cycles. So all three of these approaches, uh, really, there is no lines between them. They're not mutually exclusive. And, you know, there's enough dissension in the world where, that we don't have to have, um, you know, any, any form of disagreement or anything in between these, no matter how passionate you are there's, or where you primarily land, right? T has had these things for, for centuries. So it's important to just respect and, and, and allow people to approach tea how they, how they do and, and try and learn from them. There's no need for it to, you know. Of course, you can't avoid disagreement if you're a human being. It's just, you know, even if you're, uh, if you're a ball of sunshine, there are people that are just, they're used to the rain every day and they don't like sun. And so yeah, they, it doesn't matter how positive you are, they're just negative about your positivity or whatever it is. They just want to find something to be upset about. But um, I think it's just as you explore, especially on the internet, it's, it's easy to, to, to get, um, you know, <clears throat> lost in, in one of these. You know, I think where, where the ceremony often can, where I, which is where I mostly reside, the, the gift that I can bring to, the, to these two is, is a little bit of, um, you know, tradition. And tradition has a better memory and a deeper understanding. And I see a lot um, when I, which isn't as much as, as, as most people, in terms of tea, I explore the internet, but I don't explore the internet looking for tea um, so much as, as, as I would if I was in a different life situation. But um, when I do it, one thing I see is like a, a, a gumbo, like a hodgepodge, a casserole, of things mixed up that the person, the practitioner, m might not themselves understand or know about, right? So there, there's, you know, the, like, brewing tea in a, in a, using a chaozhou stove to pour water into a shiburadashi that you're then pouring into a Taiwanese pitcher that you then pour into a bowl made in the style of our lineage. It's just like that kind of blend of many, many um, lineages and, and wares and methods. And I don't want to, I'm not judgmental of that. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And um, in fact, in my tradition, um, something that my teachers and have encouraged from the beginning and something I also encourage of my students is experimentation. Never take my word for anything. Um, a spirit of experimentation is good. It helps to explore and learn and, and it should never, that should never be, end. that's good. So um, from that perspective, it, it, it's, you know, it's there. And I don't think any of these lineages would have any judgment about that mix either. Um, and yet, I think there's some perspective missing in that because 
you know, like that Shiburodashi was designed to do something. It was built in a certain way and, and by people over time, and you're kind of sidestepping that. Um, I don't know, I mean, to, to what degree that, that uh, resonates as disrespect to you is, is up to you as individuals. Again, I don't have any judgment. I'm not, uh, on behalf of even my tradition, let alone any other tradition, I don't want to stand as like judge of you did this or that or this, this other thing. So I don't have any judgment. Um, so that's, I think that's a personal decision. Is, there, is, there, is it disrespectful to do that or not? I don't know. But it's just a question. Um, in the least, though, I can say there, you, you're, you're missing, I guess, some of the, uh, some of the richness of where, where that thing comes from, how it's used, its history, um, you know, why it was created, what it was created to do. So, you know, you, there's a, these things were often refined over, over generations to, to perform specific functions in specific ways, sometimes um, for practical reasons and sometimes for ceremonial reasons, right? When you go to learn sword form from this school of Kung Fu versus this Japanese uh, Bushido school, right? This school, they have their own like version of katanas and this Chinese Kung Fu school, they have their own type of sword that, that is more flexible. And they will insist that you buy their sword and, or a sword you know, made in that lineage, and there's a reason for that, and the reasons are partially practical. So, you know, the movements in Japanese sword form, the sword's more rigid because the movements are more rigid. It's, it's more of a, like chopping, and the, and the Chinese sword is used more flexibly and often one-handed, and so you need that flexibility. So there's all kinds of little practical details in why the sword has to be that sword, but there's also ceremonial things, like this sword might have a dragon on the hilt and it might be a certain type of dragon and that's in relation to uh, some teacher's 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 teacher who, and it has some symbolism that connects to that lineage and connects to that, you know, etc. So I think, you know, T-Ware all has this, this depth of history and, this, and, and, and there's a lot of practical things in it and a lot of, I'm just using T-Ware as an example of what I mean, but there's, there's a depth of history in, in the practical elements, the significance of of what it does and why, and also ceremonial things that are related to, to people and culture and, and all kinds of stuff that um, is deep and vast. And I think all that's uh, worth exploring. And uh, so again, I don't want to trample on anybody's spirit of uh, experimentation, quite the opposite. I want to, as enthusiastically as I possibly can, encourage you to experiment and um, in, in, in whatever configuration. Um, so that's just an example, I think, of, of a place where, um, where, some of, where the, this, this approach could, could maybe, if, if, if there was a, a desire for dialogue and communication, they, they, there could be a, a, that. I think, you know, as I said, the people who drink tea as a beverage, um, us, because, you know, Probably if you're sitting here listening to this, you're more of a connoisseur or, or into ceremony. And so, you know, we could, we could stand to benefit from those people's approach just in the sense of like relaxing and not being so picky and not, and not I guess, just, uh, you know, getting this spirit of tea is, is hospitality and kindness and, and, and peace and love. And, and so I think they, they, they got that down. And, and, and there's a, they, we, can, we can, you know, we can absorb some of that too. Some, some of that kind of, I guess you could say, relaxation. But the main message I just want to say is, is that there's no lines between these and, and there's no, uh, you know, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't approach these things as like disagreements, as like my way's right way, your way's wrong way, or anything like that. Um, I don't think either that like, uh, that there's no quality and, and that, you know, you just do it however you like, it, 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 that's not so. Um, but even if I, even if I, you know, I'm fully committed to the practice that I practice, the way that I do things um, in my tradition, that doesn't mean that I should approach other traditions with an air of, like, condescension or 
Like my, you know, if you only, you know, of course I, I, <laughs> I love my way the best. If if I, you know, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be any level or pride. Right? It's just like the analogy I often use is is like my. Uh, you know, my wife, I guess, is the is the is a good one. There's two or three analogies I use, but the best one I think is just say that. You know, I, I really love my wife, and, and I I absolutely do think that she's the best woman on earth, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I think that all other dudes in the world are just screwed and they're 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 all losers now because <laughs> I've got the only one that's the best. You know, it's like a dad who's watching his son play baseball. He's like, that's, you know, that's my son out there. And, and that I'm the proudest of him because he's my son. And uh, that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean I, that he's better than all the other kids or of more value or something or that, that you know, that you can't approach it from that way, you know. So that's more of a, of a really healthy attitude. It's more just like, what could I learn from this other perspective, how do I absorb it, and how do I, uh, you know, how, do, how, does, how does connection happen? And through a love of tea, the connection should always be easy, no matter what approach you're coming from. So, you know, sometimes human beings don't, they're difficult to connect with, but, um, you know, we, we all should, as tea people, facilitate that and make it as easy as possible to just connect to that person on the from the approach that they're coming to, especially if you're the guest. You know, if you're the host, then you can kind of determine what's going to happen when people come to your place. But if I go to, you know, if I go to my buddy's place and he wants to chat about the tea market and, and other stuff and kind of geek out on connoisseurship, I'm totally there with him. And if I hang out with my, somebody in my family or something where tea is just a beverage, then you know, we drink tea out of mugs and chat about movies <laughs> and, and, and et cetera, right? So uh, these aren't higher or lower levels. They're just aspects of life and they're just approaches. Um, I, I personally feel like it's, uh, a tea journey is much more enriched by all of them. But I don't feel like it's a necessity or that like, you know, these people are, are silly because they don't have this, or these people are silly because they don't have this, or that, you know, it, it really is um, okay, but uh, there's a lot in all, in, in all of these, and a lot of joy as well, and, and reward, so I feel like they're all aspects of, of, uh, of life, and I, and, I, and I feel like this one, you know, as time has gone on, we've moved into these two, and this one has become weirder and weirder, which I have no problem with, I'm I'm cool with the fact that I'm weird. I've always been weird. So just, you know, I'm a weirdo. And I'm fine with that. Um, you know, however, there is a, there is a, there are questions worth asking. Like, you know, what is spiritual health? Most people have, a, have an understanding of what uh, physical health is and psychological well-being. But is there such a thing as spiritual health? What does it mean to be healthy? Uh, what does it mean to be unhealthy in that way? Because I, I think you can find very strong evidence of people who are physically fit, extremely fit, but kind of spiritually unhealthy and lost, and vice versa. People who are dying and their body's coming apart, but they're spiritually very healthy. So um, I think these questions maybe aren't asked enough, and it's what they're worth asking, they're worth, they're worth talking about and discussing. So that's my little lesson for today, or discussion or exploration. I, I, most of these things are just questions. They're just ideas for you to explore and, and think about. Um, but it was something that um, came up in a conversation and, and I thought it was worth sharing. If you do also start exploring tea, especially in the internet, and you feel like these approaches are at variance or something, it's the humans really that are at variance, not the approaches. Um, and that's just because people are passionate and they tend to disagree, especially on the internet, right? So. Uh, but really, I feel like uh, all these things are, are not, there's no division between them at all. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. Um, I'll try to get to them all. Um, I'm not going to 
share the names of the people who asked them. I'll just keep them all anonymous. So the first question is, what are your thoughts on when to have the teapot lid on and when to leave it off when it comes to tea genres, brewing method, or any number of current steepings, etc.? And why? That's a good question. Um, but first, before I ans answer that question, I want to repeat something that I say very often, which is, uh, don't steep the tea, don't steep the genre. Right? You, you steep this tea. In fact, you can narrow that down to this steeping. Right? Steep this tea, don't steep a genre. You can't steep a genre. There's no recipe for genres. There's this tea, and it has its way of being prepared. So, it ha you know, you, that's the... That's the that's where you want to aim for. Um, that said, I will, you know, in typical Zen fashion, contradict myself and step back. Uh, taking the teapot off, taking the teapot lid off, um, is helpful when you have a large pot. I, I, I like that you asked brewing method. Um, I think this happens more with a side handle. But it could happen in Gong Fu Tea too if you have a large pot. So if you have a large pot and you're brewing either a red tea or some green teas, um, for the most part. Again, I don't like the whole like brew, brewing genre tips. <laughs> I like more of this tea tips. But uh, for light, light, you could put maybe Bao Dong in this category, light oolong, green tea, and uh, for... Um, and for red tea, these are the primary ones. There's might, there might be some other examples scattered about, but for these, if you have a large pot, that means there's a lot of space in the pot. And what's gonna happen if you keep the lid on is uh, the tea is going to steam. Um, and why this doesn't apply to other types of tea is complicated and, and uh, might, go beyond the bounds of what we have space and time for here, I'm sorry. But, uh, but that, that, that steaming will do, it, it's especially relevant in side handle tea where people are drinking bowls and so they're gonna take longer to drink. So there's, there's more pause between steepings in a, in a bowl tea ceremony than there is in Gong Fu tea. Uh, so that, ideally in Gong Fu tea you wanna reduce the time between steepings as much as possible. You know, you don't want to rush and like just consume the tea. But, uh, you know, one of the benefits of drinking tea with people who know how to drink tea, especially when you're brewing gong fu, is that, the, you know, the rhythm can go a little bit faster. There's a lot of reasons for that. But in bowl tea, obviously, people are, you know, meditating the, the ceremonial side of it. And so you can have a lot more time between steepings. And you've got a large pot. And so the leaves are going to steam. And that's going to do two things. It's going to make the tea less patient. And it's also going to give it a kind of steamed flavor. It'll give it a flavor a little bit akin to, um, to uh, boiled tea, and, um, which is not a problem if you don't mind that. But um, what it will do is, you know, oftentimes, especially the, the early steepings of red tea are where you get the, a lot of the sweetness and, and, and flowery, fruity fragrance, and that will diminish more quickly. Um, so... For those teas, we tend to, in those situations, tend to take the lid off. Otherwise, it's the opposite. You want to preserve heat on the inside, and so um, you would want to keep the lid, lid on. That gets complicated and goes off into other directions um, that, I, sorry, I don't have time for. You can bring up further those questions later on. Uh, next question. Will there be any new cakes like the Moonlight White from a few years ago? I love Moonlight White tea. Uh, very possible we could do some this year or... Another year, Moonlight White is a type of, uh, of poor, technically. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the ones we had usually came from Jingu. Um, there's other places as well that can make it, but um, I, I think that's the one you're talking about. I'd love to uh, make some more tea from there if that happens. Um, as the person seeks the leaf, the leaf seeks the person. Our flow with teas tends to be... Uh, we don't seek so much. We let things find us. Uh, okay. Um, some of these questions, obviously this is global tea hut. So some of these questions are coming from people around the world and English isn't their first language. Um, so I'll do my best. Uh, when tea teachings become something organic, when I manage to internalize the technique 
and the steps and the movements come out as something natural. I feel more available and uh, I try to go to the beginner's mind. But I feel that I also forget the meaning of why I'm doing it this way. Um, this, this, you know, the, 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 no, you're on the right track. <laughs> like the, the purpose in practicing movements over and over and over again is not to constrict. It's the opposite. The more you practice doing things in a formal way, the more it becomes part of you and the more it becomes a rhythm so that you can sh do what is appropriate in any given situation. Like, like I just said, brew the tea. You can adapt to the environment that you find yourself in, right? It's like a martial artist who practiced forms over and over and over again. So that, you know, if he's in a conflict in a bar, let's say, or, you know, to defend a, a child or a woman or whatever, that he can't use any of those forms, obviously. He has to adapt to the tapestry of the situation he finds himself in. But all those forms are within him and have empowered him. So in order for the great guitarist to go on stage and just let loose, he or she has to first practice forms for decades. This is, you know, the forms do not constrict freedom. They empower it. They create the muscle memory. They create the... the the, the power that makes you comfortable in any situation, right? So even psychologically, practicing the form over and over and over and over again creates the, the psychological confidence to handle yourself in, in a new situation when, when things need to be adapted, right? Oftentimes you see, I see it a lot, I guess, in spiritual communities in the West. And something I ha you have to be careful of in yourself, where, which is that understanding that freedom is the goal can become an excuse to get lazy and not practice the form, right? So the charging does not skip the form just to, just to, because freedom is the goal. That doesn't work. Right? This, this tension happens sometimes with East and West, this misunderstanding when uh, they, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but some of the early stories, of, for example, of um, Master Suzuki when he came to America and people in San Francisco were like, you know, I'm not, I can't come to the meditation this Saturday. I have to, there's a Grateful Dead concert in the park. And he would say like Zen of Grateful Dead concert. And they would say like, this vegetarian food's not good for me. I'm going to eat a burger. And he'd say Zen of eating burgers. And so they were they, like, his answers were just like, if the situation, if the, if, you, if the universe puts you in a concert, then Zen of concert. If the universe puts you in the situation of burger eating, then Zen of burger eating. But this could be misinterpreted. This Zen is doing whatever you want. It could be interpreted as like an excuse to skip the form, right? That T is loose and free. Oh, therefore, there's no form and don't practice. That's not really how it works. Rock and roll is loose and free. But there has to be practice to empower it to be thus. Or, or what there is is just sloppiness. Right? The best rock and roll is when you have really skilled musicians who are well rehearsed and practiced. And then they're able to get loose and free. That's the, like the best athletes in the game. They have to be prepared. The ball might spin or go a different direction than they've ever practiced. So they have to be fully in the zone in the moment. But the best athletes will have lots of practice. <laughs> They've been practicing for decades, years, right up until the week before the match they were practicing. And so the best athletes are the ones who are loose and free. But it's a, it's a, it's a trained body, loose and free, right? So that's, the, that's where the, the juju is, is when, the, when you have the trained, the one who is trained in the form and then you set them free. All right. So as far as forgetting the meaning, I don't think it's essential to remember the ceremonial significance in all of the movements. They're embodied in it. You don't need to say them or think them in terms of words. It's good to contemplate that occasionally. I don't think it's a good thing to contemplate it during a ceremony. That's something where you step outside of and contemplate from the outside. Um, but the, those understandings of those meanings have to be inside. 
we have a saying in Zen, right? I burned the, the um, scriptures in my bag, but the verses in my gut will remain forever. So it doesn't matter how many sutras you can recite or how many you carry in your bag. Right? It matters what's, what you've digested, what you've become. So that's an that's a answer to your question. Uh, the next question is, um, how do you learn to appreciate discomfort in practice? Um, I don't know. Appreciate, I guess that can start to happen um, in terms of the lessons that, that it provides. But, you know, we have a saying in Zen, right, which is uh, without Zen, even a good day is a bad day. And with Zen, even a bad day is a good day. Uh, without Zen, Zen you could just take as, you don't have to take as Buddhism, you could take it as meditation. Um, without insight, you know, even a good day is a bad day because you'll get attached to those good days. And then when they inevitably roll into their counterpart, when the warp becomes a woof, when the one becomes a zero, when the topography of your life goes from up to down, you're going to, be, you're gonna, it's gonna be misery, right? So you, you'll be stuck, you'll be attached, you'll be clingy. You want all days to be like that. And you won't let go of it very easily. But with Zen, even a bad day is, you know, even just discomfort, it's not that we seek discomfort, don't create discomfort. It's not masochistic. So it's not about making it, but, it, but life is full of it. So you don't have to make it. It's just a part of life. And so we have to use that as well to enrich our understanding of life, to create wisdom. So, you know, turn all suffering into medicine. Turn it into medicine. Medicine is bitter. But you can learn to appreciate the bitter medicine once you start to experientially um, feel or understand the positive effects, right? Like if I'm really sick and I take this very bitty, bitter, nasty medicine, as soon as it starts to make me feel better, I can cultivate an appreciation for it. Um, and, you know, really, any day above the ground is a good day. There's an eternity of, of, of intimacy and, and beyond this life very soon. So any, any day is a, is a good day. Any day is there's something to learn, something to breathe, something to be. Um, this is a silly question. It says, will human beings make tea on Mars one day? I have no idea. I hope so. That's rad. I like the idea of thinking of that. I think you can make a char seed and uh, uh, that's all red. And maybe you, you, you make some tea so you pretend you're on Mars. They're, they're up there right now. NASA with some stuff. I've, I hope more energy and time uh, and resources uh, are invested in space exploration than have been the last few decades. When I was a young boy, there was a lot more. I wish there was more now. Um, I think, I, I guess that's starting again, and, and that's really nice to see. I think it's important that we explore space, and, and if there's humans on, on Mars, then maybe they'll drink tea there. Uh, next question. I would like to know everything on the present status regarding the new center. Latest news, if any. Uh, thank you. Um, we're, we're, just, we're in the process of, of looking. If you saw it in March, we usually send it in February, Chinese New Year, but we sent it in March this year, the financial report that you all got, Global TF members, so you'll be able to see where we're at financially. Um, we have a lot of assets in T and Tware, so if you don't want to just donate money, you can to our GoFundMe, but if, you don't wanna, if that's not what you want to do, you can just help us to liquidate all that T and Tware because all the T and Tware that you're buying is coming from, right now we have something four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars worth of assets. So the more we liquidate that, the more financially we step closer to that. Um, again, as, as I said, as, as a person seeks a leaf, leaf seeks the person, I think it's the same for the property. Uh, I don't know about where you live, but here in Taiwan, the property laws are extremely complicated, um, especially land, just bare land. It's, 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 it's extremely complicated zoning. They're trying to, it's a good thing. They're trying to prevent um, too much expansion and growth and building, et cetera. So they're trying to control that. And so there's a lot of complications and, you know, that's the decision. Do we want to buy a property that already has a building on it and renovate it? Or do we want to buy land and slowly build? There's a lot of those types of questions. The biggest um, kind of bottleneck right now 
um, for the last year is, is the bottleneck that I think everything, everything's facing uh, this last year, which is just the pandemic. And overall, uh, that bottleneck is, 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 is an issue. Um, how, uh, direct, how it's directly affecting the progress of the center is simply that, um, you know, this is something that we want to do together. And so there are some people that have helped us in the form of guidance and, and you could say advisors since the beginning. And, um, and, and those advisors and, 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 and volunteers and helpers and, and uh, you know, be they financial support or be they in terms of advice and guidance, none of them are able to come here right now. So um, when we, the properties that we have found, it's a little bit challenging because we can't show them to the people in whose trust we, you know, wh whom we trust to help guide us to make final decisions. Um, but there are some, there are some negotiations happening. There are some um, promising properties happening. And we, we will keep you in the loop. We've continued to make videos about potential places, even though many of them didn't work out. We still made videos about them. Um, you know, not even you just to keep you guys in the loop because it's your center as well. And uh, so uh, if you can't support in any of purchasing tier T wear or donating money, then please help pray for us. Um, so I, I, I think that is also a currency that we need. So that's the best I can do. Um, we will you know, hopefully make some more videos soon if we find anything promising or if anything takes a step in any direction. But right now, we do have a couple promising places that we're just waiting for an opportunity for Taiwan to open up a little bit so that some uh, of our advisors can come and, and uh, help us. Uh, what advice would you give to a tea practitioner who is sitting at home and meditating alone without a teacher? Surely there should be guidance uh so basically how do you practice if you're stuck at home alone in a <laughs> in a pandemic well i think that's you know it's a perfect opportunity to practice i think it's a it's a it's a misunderstanding to to assume that that i don't have enough tools i need more tools right it's just like you know it's like anything it's like a photographer saying if only i had that one light if only i had this new thing if i only had this new a camera or this other lens or this other this or that I'd make better photography but no you wouldn't right you already have the tools that you need to make good photography uh, p potentially that tool could help you to create uh, create something uh, different right to explore or or to, that tool could help make things com more convenient and save you more time that's often what tools help us do is, is that or they provide some some quality some genuine quality but they're not necessary you have enough tools so i would examine the part of you that is like bored like i i have the teachings i need i need to move on to the next level there's no level right in tea we there's scrolls often in the tea rooms right one to ten ten to one so you go one to ten and then what do you do you just go back to one beginner's mind you can start in the beginner's mind every day you can practice just leaves in a bowl you can you know, you have the, all the, if you know, if you have a meditation technique and you have a space and a time to meditate, do you have all that you need? What, what, what is the, what is missing? Right. Um, and I think, you know, the biggest danger for, for any spiritual technique is, and, and this is where, I think this in our modern age, especially this is, probably the greatest obstacle to progress I, in tea, I think, and also in, in, in spiritual practices as well. I see it everywhere, which is, which is turning the teachings inside out, right? You got this coat that was given to you to keep you warm and you turn it inside out because the inside is obviously cooler, cooler looking. I mean, it's, it's fashionable. What I mean is that, let me try and put this another way. These are inward moving teachings. They are, they are teachings to take you in, in. And there is a propensity, especially for beginners, to 
take that inward moving teaching and project it out. Because you, you go in and you see, wow, it's beautiful in there. And then, of course, you have a natural desire to share it. And then there's a, then there's a, it, it, you turn the code inside out. Right? And it all becomes about projecting, right? When actually it should be uh, 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 about listening. And you don't need many tools, right? You don't need many, uh, you don't need, you don't need, you know, people used to make this excuse a lot to my, my teacher, especially when the, the lay people that came from the city, you know, I don't have a meditation cushion. He would say, fold up a towel. And they would say, uh, just like this person, they would say, I don't have a sangha. I don't have a community of meditators where I live. And he would say, get a cat. <laughs> Cats are very zen. So you get a cat, right? As in, like some, as in some old saying, I've known many zen masters and they're all cats, right? Get, you don't have a sangha, get a cat. You don't have a cushion, fold up a towel. You don't have teachings, go to the library. Go on to amazon.com and type... Buddhist sutras, and you can have all the teachings of thousands of years shipped to your door, right? They, you literally then will have a pile of, you know, upstairs, there's a bookshelf here in my home filled with more teachings than I could even study in a lifetime, let alone digest. I, don't even, I wouldn't even have enough time in an entire lifetime to even actually like study them, let alone to actually pra put them into practice and, and become them. So... You can, they're, they're, you know, you need teachings, they're there. There's sutras going back all the way, you know, thousands of years. And, and, and you need a cushion, fold up a towel. And you need a sangha, get a cat. You don't, you don't need anything, in other words, basically, right? You, the answers are within you. you. You just need to practice. And so I would look at the part of you that is, um, the, the, the part of you that your practice is moving outward instead of inward, the part of you that is thinking like I'm bored with it as it is, I want to add something to it or increase it somehow, right? Um, next one, in the upcoming courses on the seven genres of tea and the poor course, so the next courses that were online courses we're going to do is the seven genres of tea and a poor course, the seven genres of tea first and then the poor course. Will you be covering the finer details in brewing and steeping each type of tea? I'm very excited for these courses. Uh, the simple answer is no. These aren't going to be brewing courses. These are going to be more geeky courses. They're going to be like full-on whiteboards and, and Professor Wu. And I'm going to, uh, these are going to be data-oriented courses. If you're interested in an intellectual understanding of the, of the tea world and how to approach it. I will include some brewing in there. Of course, it will come up and there will be other things. There'll be, you know, it's not all going to be linear information. There'll be some um, TCM, for example, um, and traditional Chinese medicine approach. And there'll be some, of course, spiritual things, but it, it's more going to be a, um, a, 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 like a classroom setting. You can think of it in terms of that. Like if you were going to take a I don't know, a college course or something on the seven genres of tea or poor, there's, they're going to, there's going to be maps. And there's going to be a lot of information. I plan to cover the terroir, the environment, the, the, um, the famous stories and types. The, so the history and lore, the, the processing and the, a little bit of the brewing and some of the environmental factors and some of the TCM, some depth into, into the traditional Chinese medicine approach to those different types of tea. So kind of their history, their processing, their science, their famous examples and where they're grown and maps and geeky geeky stuff so it'll be it'll be more from that perspective um, will there ever be an, a gong fu online course potentially there's some barriers to that but i'm open to it we've been discussing it um, and I, I would i would enjoy that a lot um, do you have any thoughts on aging poor in non-humid conditions such as australia um, that is a, I mean, that would be a huge part of the poor course, aging tea. Uh, that's just a very big loaded question. Uh, I don't have any answers. No, I don't. I, I, you know, the only place to successfully mature poor tea to, to, you know, traditionally it was said that 70 years was full maturity. Um, it does change beyond that, but the, there's a reason for that. It's not arbitrary. Um, but 70 years was considered full maturity and really the only place in the world to, 
fully mature tea is is Southeast Asia is is Malaysia primarily Malaysia Hong Kong Taiwan and you know of course Guangzhou and and, and Yunnan itself so uh, what happens in different places is all new I would uh, my advice for this is is the advice that I follow um, so for me the two criteria for where I want to go to get information about aging tea. There's, I have two criteria for whom I want to study with, whom I want to listen to, right? Because there's a lot of people talking. Again, the internet especially is, is a quagmire. And I don't have any problem with people sharing their experience and I don't have any judgment. I'm just sharing with you my criteria for who I want to study the aging tea from, who I want to learn from. That doesn't mean I'm not open to the experience of someone uh, like like whoever asked this question, you're in Australia probably, obviously, and you want to share with me your experience aging tea in, in Australia and how you've done it. I would listen. I would be all ears, totally. I'd geek out on it. I'd be so thirsty to hear about you and learn from your experience. But who I really want to study with, who I think has the, what, what are the two criteria that I think you need to be able to um, teach me about aging tea is number one, to have aged tea. So at least, you know, some decades. Because if you're talking poor, you're talking decades, not years, decades. Um, a tea, poor team tends to move in seven year cycles. And so let's say somebody that has experienced at least, you know, three of those cycles, two, three of those cycles, watch their tea change. They have a lot to offer. Um, and then second, I think, is someone who has consumed, someone who has drunk, has a lot of experience drinking well-aged teas. If you haven't drunk a lot of well-aged teas, then you don't even know like where you're going. <laughs> you don't know like what the result is. So somebody, I want to hear from those dudes who like, like Master Zhou who have spent, you know, 20, 30 years drinking lots of 100 year old tea, 200 year old tea, 70 year old tea, 30 year old tea, 50 year old tea, 60 year old tea. They've drunk tea at a lot of age brackets and they have a lot of experience drinking it. And so they know then, Oh, this is what good aging does. This is what, you know, poor aging does. This is what wet storage creates after 10 years, after 20, after 30. This is what dry storage creates after 10, after 20, after 30, after 40, after 50. This is what this type of storage in Taiwan versus Malaysia versus home. They've drunk lots of well-aged teas. Um, because one thing that I notice also, um, and this is, I, I more just want to poke to stir up questions. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, Again, back to what I started out, this whole thing. I don't want to, my, my perspective to be um, confrontational in any way. Um, but so with politeness, something I've noticed is that it seems sometimes for some Western people, when you read their taste, when you read, you know, what kinds of teas they appreciate and what kinds of teas they don't appreciate, right? It, it seems that they, they probably aren't going to really enjoy aged teas all that much. They probably would be better off not aging their teas because they, they don't have a lot of experience drinking a lot of aged teas. And so they don't, therefore, you know, know, know what, where their teas are going. Do you see what I mean? And... It seems as if they more appreciate the characteristics of younger teas. And they're thinking that the aged version is just going to be a better version of that. But it often isn't. It's often going to transform into something completely different. So these are the two criteria, I think, for you know, resources where I, I look for to learn from. All right, the experience aging tea for a long term, at least a few cycles if you're talking about poor, and uh, and an experience drinking lots of aged tea. Um, so, but that doesn't mean you don't have anything to share just because you've only been aging tea for a year. No, no, you can learn a lot even in a year or two years. You can learn a ton and you can share it, and there's tons to learn from. So, hmm. Is there a GTH issue that focuses on the ceremony we learned during the way of tea course? If you're talking about leaves in a bowl and side handle, yes, there are issues. And we have one coming up again this year. We tend to do it every few years, repeat these kinds of topics. Um, I think the G maybe July issue this year will also um, focus on that. 
But there are, there are several uh, leaves in a bowl issues and side handle issues if you search through the archive, including ceremonial guides with photographs and everything that show how to do the ceremonies. Um, I'd love to hear more about Uda's experience on performing tea ceremony for so many years in so many different locations. What has changed over the years? What has surprised him? Which ones have been the most meaningful? Oh, David, that's, you know, endless. I've, what a blessing. The, the, of all the, the mountain of treasures that T has brought to my life, at the very tippy top, the peak is the solid golden joy of, of the tea friends that I've made on this journey. Um, and uh, man, you know, so for me, and what, what's changed? I, I mean, I suppose I've gotten a little better. I don't know. I'm a slow student. I also, you know, Again, I told you about be careful about turning the teachings inside out. I feel like if I, I, I'm the perfect example of that old proverb that those who cannot do teach, I'm the perfect uh, uh, emblem of, of that because I feel like if I had invested as much energy and actually in my practice as I have on talking about it with other people, I'd be much further along uh, and uh, yeah. So, uh, maybe I've gotten a little better. Um, some of the most meaningful, you know, simple things. I, I, a lot of the tea sessions that were, have been had on the Global Tea trips are the ones that come to mind. You know, I've had some really spectacular tea sessions in my life. I've been really blessed. Um, and uh, some of them more private. But uh, some of those sessions in the, in the Global Tea trips, that one under the the guardian tree, the laurel tree in Yunnan, for example, um, just pops into my head. This is some of the most epic tea sessions. And, but, you know, making true friends make tea, the, the friendships that have come as are the, really the highlight of, of my journey. Um, I absolutely love performing ceremony for people out in nature, but it's important to me it remains pure and comes from the heart. What is the biggest piece of advice for balancing the ego and the heart? I think I already, I've talked about this already two times, right? These are inward moving teachings. They are teachings of receptivity. I guess another way for me to put this is this. Receptivity is the goal, not the starting point from which you like then fill up. Right? Emptiness is where, you're, is where we're going. So, uh, you know, get, getting out of the way and, and not making it so much a performance or a thing about, that you need to, that it's about sharing or being the center of and, 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 and getting yourself all stained inside of it, right? Um, sharing tea with people is wonderful. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the joys of, of tea. But drinking tea alone is also a great joy. And so, you know, it, if, 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 if a, there's old Zen saying that's like, if a rich person, then the life of a rich person. If a poor person, then the life of a poor person. It basically just means like, you know, kind of like Suzuki was saying, if you're at a concert, then Zen of concert, Zen of rich person, Zen of poor person, Zen of the situation that you find yourself in. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I, you know, getting out of the way is a big part of training, I think, f if your aim is to become, uh, if your aim is to share more. Uh, in unglazed clay, is there any possibility of heavy metal entering our system? Has there ever been a hair tissue analysis done on some time, on someone, I guess, who has used unglazed teaware for many years? The new cloudstone kennel is rich in iron. Would it be appropriate for someone with hemochromatosis? Um, I, I'm not a doctor and a scientist. I cannot answer if there's ever been any hair tissue analysis. I certainly have never done any hair tissue analysis of anything. So, uh, that would be something for uh, the internet maybe to help you. There are dangers of heavy metals in clay, particularly lead, um, in, which is why pottery was glazed for, for so long. Um, but I think that, um, you know, this would be a good, this question we should ask of my dearest friend and, and, and brother, Petr Novak, should be answering this question, not me. Um, but I, I my uninformed and 
bumbling attempt to answer this question other than to steer you in the direction of someone who actually knows what they're talking about is uh, to say that um, I think that potters have this pretty dialed in nowadays. Um, so the, the dangers of that are low. Um, in terms of there is some iron like in Tetsubin's and in our clouds, Cloudstone. Um, I think in Tetsubin's a lot more obviously than in, in our clouds, Cloudstone kettles. Is that a danger for somebody who has too much iron in their blood? I, I don't know. I would possibly in the case of a Tetsubin, I would highly doubt it in the case of iron rich clay. I would highly doubt that. But I don't know a ton about this particular uh, malady of someone who has too much iron in their blood. I don't hemochromatosis. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a ton about it. So um, I guess it would also just depend on how sensitive that person is. Um, but um, I wouldn't worry about heavy metals in the in, in kettles. You, you get more. There's other areas of environmental pollution getting into your body that are more serious to worry about. Um, but you know you can um, experiment with that and let us know. Um, but I, I think that potters nowadays are pretty tuned in to what is or is not in their clay and their their uh, you know what is safe to food safe and what is not. How do you differentiate between habitual thought and intuitive thought? Um, well, you know, this, the answer to this is the answer to, there's, there are three, as my teacher always said, there are three techniques of spiritual cultivation. They're all really good. They're all wonderful. You can choose from any one of them. And there's, so there's three, meditation, meditation, or meditation. <laughs> so meditation increases sensitivity and self-knowledge, self-awareness, and allows you to begin to understand the difference between uh, impulses, habitual thought, and intuition, which is a type of impulse. So I can understand, I'm not uh, trying to, I'm being facetious, but I'm not trying to put down the question, because it's a good question, actually, because um, impulses in terms of habitual thought, since intuition is also an impulse, they have a similar frequency. And so being able to distinguish them is just a, is just a, uh, a sensitivity issue. <coughs> More sensitivity. Which often just means less distraction, less noise. Less internal noise means more. So it's not about adding something. Sensitivity is not something we add. Again, this whole practice is about receptivity. It's about opening space. It's about decreasing density. The wisdom, the abilities are already there. You just have to release the noise, right? It's a bit like, I don't know, like I'm into audio. And so it's about you know, eliminating noise from the audio signal, not about like adding something to it. And the clear, the, the, then the music comes through more clear, right? And so the, the same with tea, when we prepare tea, we want it to come through clear. How would you choose or what would you be focused on when choosing a red tea for aging? Um, I mean, the most ageable red tea is, is going to be... Uh, Dian Hong, obviously, because it's poor, essentially. Um, but any red tea is aged, is ageable. So, um, what would I focus on? If I'm if I'm choosing red teas for aging, for me, I I think a lot of the same like aging questions come up in general. I think the first question you need to ask yourself is, will this tea age well where I live? So if you're in a place where the humidity is a lot lo lower, then Dian Hong might not be the best option. It might be better for you to choose other red teas that are, that are drier um, moisture in terms of moisture content that have been roasted um, and are just oxidizing. They aren't oxidizing and fermenting. If you are choosing Dian Hong, actually it's better to, if you can, if you have any say in the processing, it's better to get them to oxidize a little bit less than they're used to for their ordinary red tea. Um, but so the location and then space, how much space do you have for aging tea realistically? Like, and so you want to fill the majority of that space with the teas that are going to age the best where you live. So if you live in a place where oolong is going to age the best, you should have lots of jars of oolong. And then like, dude, trade that for poor later on or, you know, aged oolong is incredible anyway. Aged red tea is great. So I would, location, how much space you have. And then like, 
you know, how wonderful is that tea to consume young when it's new? Right? So if it's, if it's already above a certain quality level, um, in terms of red tea, this doesn't apply as much to poor. But it can in other certain ways. Like, for example, for me, like the, 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 if you want to pour that plays into this, the, 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 that enforces the same thing. And what I'm saying is like, I think like high road for me uh, or blessing is the version this year. It, it's not a tea I'm so interested in aging, not because it won't age well. It will. It will age. Certainly. It's from old growth trees. It's going to, it's strong. It's got lots of juju. It's going to turn into a great tea, but it's already, it has one of the, it has something extremely rare for young Shang Poor, which is that it's incredibly delicious and wonderful to drink when it's young. Not all poor is like that, for me at least. So I got to have teas to drink while my teas are aging, <laughs> is what I'm saying, right? I want to have teas that are really good, uh, that I'm not just sitting around going like, oh, this is okay, but one day I'll have some good teas. <laughs> I don't want to live like that. Right. So it, this is a this is an important question for me uh, in terms of, because space is limited. No matter who you are, you either have a cabinet or a room or a warehouse. Even if you have a warehouse. The space is limited. We have a warehouse and where our space is still limited. We, in fact, thinking of getting another warehouse. So is it crazy? So you you know, you, you, your space is limited. Uh, you have to think like if this tea is already super good, uh, then you know, probably it will age into something super good too. So there is a, there is a, in certain cases, this is, not, this is not a like blanket statement. I don't want you to make this into a law because there are exceptions, I think, on both sides. But this is just a general kind of, um, general kind of principle, I guess, is that if it's already super good, like for me, blessing is so good. Certainly, I'm going to put a little bit aside for aging. But since it's already so good, I, I, I just could drink it, you know? It's already really, 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 really good right now. So like if it's, if it's like that, I might age a bit of it. But I'd, I'd, if it's good enough, if it's like, if it's crossed that line, I guess that's different for all of us, you know? But if it's already really good, so that, that's, a, that's something for me. Um, it says, would it be better if pressed or loose leaf? That depends on the tea. Um, for Dian Hong, obviously, it's better if it's pressed. Um, for a lot of teas, you wouldn't want to press them. It would damage the, the high notes in the tea. It would damage the, the uh, especially in red teas, where you have a lot of delicate, fruity, like higher, uh, higher notes. Compression, steaming and compression would destroy that. If you compressed like elevation or, or a gongfu red tea from Chimun or something, it would, it would ruin a lot of that. So you, you, you would want those teas to be loose. And then they would be aged... Um, so it's the next question, conditions for aging red tea, is it uh, more like poor or more like oolong? Well, if it's Dian Hong, then the conditions are like poor. And if it's, uh, and if it's other red teas, then it, the conditions are very much like oolong. Most red teas in the world are essentially oolong. We t talk about them in terms of being like fully oxidized, but they're not. They're just the, you know, red tea is just the last station on the oolong line. It's just oolong tea that has been uh, often. It is just oolong tea that has been oxidized more fully. Even the stories of the origin of red tea are stories of like, you know, it's typically the, the emperor's soldiers were moving secretively because they were going to ambush some rebellion. And they stop in the tea village and tell the villagers, you got to house us for tonight. And the villagers leave aside their tea to take care of these soldiers. And because the tea was left overnight, it oxidized and thus red tea was born. Some version of those stories. So... Uh, it's very much akin to oolong in the dryness and the fill the jar completely so there's no oxygen and et cetera, et cetera. Worry about mold more if it's loose leaf. So uh, that's the best I can do in a short time. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, do, do, do. Some thoughts about the connections between Zen and tea. Um, can I speak about... Uh, speak about this connection in a way that inspires tea people to deepen their commitment to meditation and the Zen practitioners to dive deeper into tea. Simply put, why should Zen practitioners study tea and tea practitioners study Zen? Oof, this one huge. This is a whole video of, uh, all on its own. Um, how to be succinct. Um, 
Well, let me start about with my own tradition and then maybe step out because that's where I can really speak from the heart of it. Something I often tell my students is if you're not meditating morning and evening, you're not practicing tea in this tradition. Full stop. Full stop. If you are not meditating, not practicing tea. Uh, meditation and tea are one. The, his, the, the connection between Zen and tea is, is, is ancient. Tea passes, no matter what lineage you practice in tea, you, if you trace it back, it will pass through the halls of Zen. The entire mainstream of China was introduced to tea through the monasteries. There is a, is a long and rich and deep heritage there. Um, in terms of practice, why should a tea practitioner meditate? Um, because that meditation is the answer to a lot of the questions earlier. How do I prevent my ego from getting in my tea? How do I, what do I do when I'm practicing alone? You know, meditate. Meditation, seated, tea is not a substitute for seated meditation. It is a, it is an extension of it. It is a part of it. It is a flow of that, of a meditative life. It's not a, it's not a alternative, right? They are, they are from, they, they are from the same source. Your meditation will improve every aspect of your tea. It will improve your ability to prepare tea, your ability to share tea, and your sensitivity to tea as you drink it, which means you will enjoy more because you'll experience more flavors and aromas and body sensations and mouthfeel, etc. If you're a connoisseur and you meditate, you will find you, your appreciation more deep. Um, and as far as Zen practitioners, why they should study tea. I'm trying to be succinct. These are deep topics and they go, we could have a whole other video. I think we should have a whole other video about this. Um, but, uh, you know, I find, because I meditated, I guess my meditation journey and my tea journey kind of began at the same time. But um, for the first several years, I was much more focused on meditation than I was on tea. And so from that perspective, which I guess is the perspective of why someone, a Zen practitioner should be interested in tea, is I guess two reasons. Number one, there can develop, and it's very common, a, a kind of line between the cushion and life, where the cushion becomes this experience over here and life becomes experience over here. And so how do we translate more of this to this? Right? I think is a, is, the, is a deep question because if we, if you, if you want to be more, you know, these are, this is a weird way of talking, but I'm going to do it. If you want to be more spiritual, it's not really about like adding something or becoming something or accumulating something. It's about applying the, the, the meditative mind to more of your activities. Or if, if, you, if you speak in terms of religion, it would be applying the mind of, of God or prayer to more things in your day. So become more Zen or something. You know, I don't like that language, but I'm just going to use it anyway because uh, I'm stuck in it right now. Sorry. But the, the, if you, if you, uh, you know, how do we get the meditative mind into the walking up the stairs and starting the car and, and cooking and doing dishes and, and, you know, how do we bring all that? Because that's kind of the practice. So how do you live it? Right? Well, there's a Zang in sentence, might be amongst my most favorite Zen sayings, um, which is know, know yourself and then be what you know. So, actually, the insight into reality, we think of that, the insights into who I am and the world that I live in, we tend to think of that as, like, as the goal. But actually, that's just where the work really begins. That part's kind of the easier part. When you go sit in long meditation retreats, when you sit in sashin, eventually the mind quiets down. When all the internal noise dissipates, the insight is there. The water becomes clear and the insights are there. Now the really hard work is how do you architect a life that is an expression of those insights? How do you live them, in other words? This is the real challenge. How do you be what you know? Right? How do you architect a life that is an expression of your insights? That's, a, that's, the, that's the tough one. right? And a lot of Zen practitioners make the, what can be a mistake, 
It can be. I don't want to get, I don't want you to get stuck in viewing it as a mistake, but for a moment view it as a mistake. What can be a mistake is to architect a life based on the insights of others who came before. Right? And then you get into like what, what Basho said quite poignantly in one of his poems, right? I seek not to ape the, the, the ancestors, the patriarchs, but rather I seek what they sought. Right? Should be patriarchs and matriarchs. I, I seek what they sought. So I'm not seeking to ape them. So in, in architecting a life that expresses the insights to, to be what I know, right, one of the dangers is architecting that life based on the architecture of others. Um, and, you know, that's where you, um, you know, you can, you can in, in Chinese we say chan chou wei, you stink of Zen. You stink of Zen. To stink of Zen is to have a lot of like Zen clothes and Zen language and Zen books and, and, and not Zen. To not be it but to talk about it and wear it and smell like it, you know, to reek of it. So Zen Buddhism, you can think of as a basket. And that basket can very much be a wonderful aid and guide for tr transmitting and, and promoting and preserving Zen. But it can also be a problem because some baskets are empty. And some people get lost in the basket and not, you know, one, one common Zen name, NT name, it's in scrolls in, in T and Zen, is the abandoned basket, which the Buddha spoke about too. This is the raft, right, that you use to get to the other shore and then you don't need the raft anymore. The abandoned basket is the basket carries the Zen and then you abandon the basket. Um, so, you know, don't get so... It, it's easy to get rung up in the, in the, in the basket. So T can help us to architect that life that, that expresses our insights. It can help translate the cushion into life because it's a moving meditation. It's taking those meditative principles cultivated in Zazen and applying them to something very ordinary and, and, and day to day, which is, which is drinking tea. And so it's a, it, it becomes something of, of a living, breathing, moving, um, exercising, expression of your Zen and that is also powerful then the second thing that I think it provides is that is also powerful in terms of sharing because it's a it's a not it's an illogical non-rational way to share and connect directly to the moment right so um, that would be my short answer there's obviously a more a lot more there a whole video worth of things This, this the same kinds of questions coming up a lot. How can we avoid pushing our practice onto others? T gives us so much, and of course we want to share it. But how can we share it in a skillful way so that we don't push it onto others? This is w wonderful. I love this question. This is exactly what I was saying. Don't turn your coat inside out. It's like these teachings are much more beautiful on the inside. So picture a coat that is like just plain blue on the outside. But on the inside, it's like silk paisley. <laughs> glorious rainbow silk paisley. It, it, so it's much more pretty on the inside, right? So keep it that way. There's a tendency to be like, whoa, dude, this coat's so red on the inside. I'll wear it inside out, right? But you, you want that facing inward, right? Allow your, allow your, your own practice you know, those who are interested will come and they will come and they will come and they will, it, it, there's karmic stuff in this too. So let, uh, let people be, it's basically what it is. Just let them be and focus on your practice. Don't focus on their practice. <laughs> their practice is not, not your practice. And then you're starting to turn your, your, turn your coat inside out. 
It's common. You, the coat starts to benefit you and it's beautiful. And so you get enthusiastic and you want to like, I, I'm guilty of this, especially long ago when I first started getting into meditation and Buddhism. I was guilty of like pushing everybody in my family to go sit meditation courses and like, you know, ruining family gatherings by only talking about Buddhist meditation. You know, back when I was like 20, I'd come to the family gathering and I'd just come back from you know, 10 day retreat and I'm so enthusiastic because of the positive influence it had in my life. And even in the retreat, I'd be sitting there like on day six, distracting myself with like, oh, dude, dude my, my mom should really be, take a course like this. And oh, like my friend, my friend, he, he, you know, he would be, he would benefit from this so much. I can't wait to tell him. Like, and then I'd get home and tell him and just, you know, be a, an all around dingbat, right? <laughs> Basically, and, and, and annoy people. And there's no need for that. There's no, uh, there, there's no need to just let the, you know, if you look at faces from the masses, there's a famous story that is retold. I retell it in my own way, but it's about Hazra Inya Khan. And like he, you know, the story is basically really short. Like he, they, they build this big lecture for him where he's going to talk about Sufism. And he, he, shows up, he shows up like, first of all, like two hours late. And by that time, like 30% of the crowd has gone away. And then, and then he, and then he, uh, he like, he's drunk. And he comes on stage and like drops a bottle and like he's blah, 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 completely drunk. And as a result of that, like almost everybody goes away. And this crowd of thousands has become like 15 people. And then he sits up, right. And he's like, all right, come up here on stage. Right. And he says, you know, like, let this sleeping people sleep. They need their sleep. They basically like tread quietly and, and don't disturb. Um, it, 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 it's this way, you know, walk, walk quietly with your coat turned inward and the, the right, don't worry about quantity. The right ones will find, share your practice. And you don't have to share your practice with the intention of getting other people to practice like you. That's unnecessary, and it's not a, it's not a, a helpful quality to have in your, um, uh, in your, you know, in, in your life. So, in, in your practice, it, and so you, you just, you know, you, you walk quietly, walk quietly. You know, Zen teachers going back thousands of years, they all had. This is one of the things I struggle with the most as a Zen teacher is how to how to bring this, like some of these old methods that were incredibly effective, but are completely unsuitable to the modern era. How to like, how to get the same effects without them. It's like basically how to cook the same pie when you don't have access to one of the main ingredients. And how do you translate them? If, if you are going to keep them, how do you translate them to the modern era? You know, one of those was, you got to remember like, not only were teachers out in the mountains and there was no Google or you couldn't like go online and sign up for a course that you pay for and think you're owed something as a result of paying for it. it. You had to like really literally kind of go out and find these dudes. They were in the middle of nowhere, often up like very dangerous paths, like around cliffs and, and hidden. They didn't want to be found. And then when you get there, they throw icy water on you. They don't want you there. <laughs> you have to like, pass through all kinds of like, and this was done, the throwing icy water was done to like winnow out all the ones who are not fully committed, I guess. And not only, not only will the person like, you know, you get icy water, you hike all for days to find this teacher and they throw icy water on you and you're like, oh, this place is abusive and you leave. Not only are you going to never go back, but you're going to tell all your buddies, don't go to that temple. They throw icy water on you, right? But then occasionally, like, this is real. This, these are real stories. Like, you, then you have, like, there's a famous story of two monks who searched for this famous uh, master for, for a year. And they finally found him after a year of searching. And he threw icy water on them. And one of them, like, stood up. And it was in meditation. Like, he got up and threw icy water on them. And then one of them stood up and bowed and said, Master, if you think... You know, we've been searching for a year for this. If you think icy water is going to drive us away, you've got another thing coming. Sat back down, covered in icy water. And then the teacher was like, hmm, good. <laughs> went, went back and sat down, right? So this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff obviously doesn't float now. And so uh, 
I guess you, you get the point though. These, these dudes were inward oriented. They're not counting Instagram followers and, and likes and hearts. They're not trying to get anything from anyone. And I think the more you share in that way, with like almost like you could say like a, an, an ambiance of like people pleasing, I'm gonna give you what you want kind of thing, the less, the more you lose your independence and your integrity and sense of self, right? And whereas like, you know, I've spoke about this before, but I'll speak about it now. 99% of what informs what I choose to translate for the global TIA issues that do have translations. So we have two types of issues. We have issues where we do more of the writing, we as a community, or we here in Taiwan, right? Like the food issue would be an example of that. The Zen issue would be an example of that. And then we have issues where we translate. And so when I translate, I'm choosing topics that I want to study and just hoping that there's others that are interested in that same thing, right? So, you know, I, I recently watched a really rad documentary. It just came out a little while ago. If you haven't seen it, check it out about, about Zappa, an amazing human being. Um, and uh, he says, he often says something like that. They got, he says it over and over again throughout like decades, even as in these interviews where he just says, look, I make the music that I want to make. And if, if somebody else gets enjoyment from it, then that's rad too. Right? But this is what my soul is called to, to create. There's only a few more. We're almost done. Are there any practices that absolutely do not belong in a life of tea that we should get rid of? Uh, I, I don't want to make a list of things like that. You know, there are certainly like, there are practices when, as in a world that is this rich. Because we're rich. You can study Sufi dancing and Zen and tea and yoga and like all in your community. You have access to this so much in your supermarket and whatever, you got food from all over the world. It's the same thing. So there are teachings that, you know, you got to learn the art of gardening. There are plants that can grow next to each other and they neither help nor harm each other. And there are plants that will help each other, like corn, bean, and squash, the three sisters. They'll like give each other all the things they need and, and be in perfect symbiosis. And then there are... There are techniques that don't work in the same garden. There are plants that will hinder each other. So you need to get sensitive to that in this age. That's a skill that's required. Ideally, you want to at least choose practices that neither help nor harm each other. And, and even better, choose practices that are symbiotic and, and helpful, right? Um, if you want just a real easy recipe, if you're starting from scratch, of, of practices that, that align perfectly with tea, it would be the practices that grew up along with tea, right? Zen, meditation, martial arts, like Qigong, Tai Chi, uh, you know, those, and tea, and uh, along with uh, um, uh, meditation, those are practices, I think, that align very well. Mm. Is it possible to have two Daos at the same time? For example, Cha Dao and the Dao of painting, or is it something lost? Um, I, I think, is it something lost in splitting our efforts into two different areas? I would say yes. Uh, life is short. Um, I don't think that one has to have only one interest and be completely into that. I, I have a lot of interests. I'm interested in photography. I'm interested in music and, and hi-fi. I'm interested in pens. <laughs> I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in painting. I'm interested in a lot of things, but tea is my Dao. Uh, and, you, you know, you, you, if you have two buckets and you have a limited amount of time, so like, just think of it this way, like you have an hour and you have this little pitcher and it's only, it only holds a little bit of water and you have to go to the stream and get the water and pour it in the buckets, right? If you have th two buckets or three buckets versus somebody that has one and we time them for an hour, right? That person will have a lot more in that one bucket. And if you've spread it out over three buckets, you'll have a lot less in each one of those buckets. So you will understand each of those buckets less. The mastery is, you know, I, I, I think it's like really, it, it, it's like anything. You can, you can get 90% of anything in like, in like 10 years or t they say 10,000 hours, right? Like that you get the 90% in the 10,000 hours, but then the final 10% will take you the rest of your life and you may not ever get there. Because some of that last 10% is also affinity. It's like inborn talent. You can't do anything about it. 
So you will spend the next decades and you might get another percent or two, but some of those percents in that top 10 are, are to do with just like, you know, the, the, the stuff that separates, you know, the, Michael Jordan and, and other great NBA basketball players or something. It's, you know, some of it's just inborn. It's affinity. Uh, but it, it becomes slow and it becomes methodical and it becomes, it, it, it starts to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, so... Um, time is limited in this life. You want to be a jack of all trades and master of none, or do you want to master something? Um, because if you master something, you master everything. That's my advice. <clears throat> but have interests. I think it's really important, especially for spiritual practitioners, to have hobbies that do not get in the way of their practice. So that we, like I started out this conversation saying one of the things we could learn from those who approach tea as a beverage is to not take ourselves or our practice so seriously. When you have a hobby, Right. And it doesn't interfere with your practice. Like, like, you know, I have many hobbies. I just told you I paint, I write, I listen to music. I love hi-fi. I love music. But I would I would never skip meditation to do those things. So it's not in the way, but it also brings levity to my life. It connects me. It makes me more grounded and more human. <clears throat> What are the differences in the body between Shung and Shopur, especially the nervous system? I think that's more of an answer that needs to be researched in terms of, of you know, biochemistry and, and those types of things. I don't really have an answer for that. Um, my answer to the difference between Shung and Shopur or, or the consumption of Shung and Shopur would be more from an experiential perspective. That's all I would really have to offer. Something in terms of TCM, something in terms of um, spiritual practice something in terms of my own ex psychosomatic experience, but not in terms of, of the body and biochemistry. I don't have an answer to that. I think that's something I would be interested in reading about. I wish there was some research providing some more data about the difference between Shung and Shou in terms of its impact on the chemistry of the body. <clears throat> I would like that. In fact, one of the things I think is missing from the most tea research in the, in the world is that it, the, the researchers know a whole lot about the biology or chemistry that that th that they're coming from, the field that they're coming from, but they don't know anything or very little about tea. So you have to wonder about like varietal, environment, agrochemicals, pollutants, um, Shung versus Shou in a poor study, right? And so, you know, and the, there's such a tremendous difference between the different mountains in Yunnan and the different varietals of trees in those mountains and garden types. And, and so I, it would be nice if, if more of the researchers had a better understanding of tea that they could bring into the, the, the study. And I think that would, at least from the perspective of a tea person, that would be better, right? I think a lot of the studies tend to be too general and they're often done with like tea bags or things that, you know, are grown in much more conventional ways. And so if they find something detrimental, you have to wonder, is that applicable to organic, like ecological tea and or ecological tea? Uh, I don't know. Like, is it more of a pollution in the environment or is it because tea is very sensitive and sucks things up or if they find health benefits same thing are those benefits in every varietal it would be nice if there's more uh, such research between like the difference between shang and shou but i can only answer that from like a tcm perspective or from a um from an experiential perspective is there a specific way to store each type of tea uh, do you think do you think all like to be in airtight jars or bags? And what about in drier climates? No. So uh, poor black tea by black tea. I mean black tea, not what is mistakenly called black tea in the West. These uh, need humidity and they need to oxidize and ferment. So they need airflow to keep the fermentation, the the, the anaerobic, the the microecology healthy. Most teas uh, are just oxidizing as they age like oolongs, uh, green teas, etc. We made a video recently about Wind in the Pines, which talks about aging green tea. Um, jars are always better than bags, but if you don't have space for jars or the money for jars for every one of your tea, then obviously uh, bags are uh, an alternative. But storing in a jar will always be better. Um, and if it's airtight, that's good. You want it to be... Um, glazed with certain types of tea and unglazed with others because unglazed allows more airflow and, and looser for the especially poor and black teas and, and what about drier climates drier climates are better for storing teas that just oxidize like oolongs and um, 
red teas, especially oolongs, I would focus on if you're in a drier climate and um, poor needs a, a wetter climate. Can you talk about the relationship between Guan Yin and tea? I've always thought she was a, a tea-specific goddess de deity. Wondering if there's more to that story. Guan Yin is not... Guan Yin is right here. I, I worship Guan Yin myself um, and have for many, many years. Guan Yin is not a tea-specific deity. Guan Yin is a Buddhist uh, bodhisattva um, of the highest order of bodhisattva. And Guan Yin is not... Um, in Sanskrit, her name is Avalokiteshvara, the one who, who hears all cries. She hears all cries of the world. She's mercy. She's not even a she. Many of them are hermaphroditic. The one I have right here is hermaphroditic uh, because Guan Yin is able to take the form of whatever is needed. Wherever there is mercy, wherever there is compassion, um, wherever there is help, that is an embodiment of Guan Yin. Guan Yin is that energy in the world. Guan Yin is actually, her shape is often based on Mary. Um, Avokadeshvara was more av uh, hermaphroditic or more male until Christianity came to China and there wasn't enough female goddesses. There was just Shi Wang Mu. And so, um, the, like, you know, the veil that you often see Guanyin wear, that is not a Chinese article of clothing. It's, it's Mary. And, and the early Guanyins actually all were holding a baby just as Mary was. So she's based on Mary and a similar kind of energy too. The mother, mercy, unconditional love is what Guan Yin represents. Now, is Guan Yin connected to tea in the same way that all Buddhism is connected to tea? In the same way that all... Guan Yin is, is arguably the most prevalent de um, deity in, uh, in China. And there are some who worship her in the, in the way of a deity. But traditionally, she's a, she's a Buddhist bodhisattva. And you can look into what that means more deeply. It's beyond the, this question. So there are stories and relationships. The most obvious one would be um, tea from Anxi, which is called Te Guan Yin, Iron Guan Yin. Um, and the, if you look, we have issues in Golotia that relate the stories, the legends, a few versions of them actually, of why that tea is called Guan Yin. And so you have some stories of, of Guan Yin that are related to tea because all of Buddhism is related to tea. All of Chinese culture is related to tea as well. So everything Chinese is you will find some place where it crosses T, um, everything, including Guan Yin. But there's nothing really, sp other than that Anxi T, um, there's nothing really specific about T, though they, they share a lot of the same spirit, right? Because you could say that T is amongst the more um, compassion-based practices within Buddhism. And Guan Yin represents that. We have a thousand-armed Guan Yin in our office. Right? And each of the arms holds uh, medicine, different types of medicine. Books, because you know wisdom is, is a type of medicine. So there's medicine like the sutras. And then you know all kinds of medicine, money, things that people need to find healing. And there's tea leaves in some of the arms. So some of the people need tea. Actually, the Thousand Arm Guan Yin only has 998 arms. Right? And so where are the last two? You need to... Think about where the last two are. Any suggestions for which teas to share with people coming to sit for the very first time? I have been using Elevation as a sort of gateway tea, and I'm curious if there's others you would suggest. Um, yeah, Elevation is a great tea. I would suggest using simple teas and teas that you like a lot. Again, right? Rest, be comfortable in sharing where you're at and where you're coming from, but with the aim of, of, of honoring and giving to, get to the guest. Um, never serve a tea that you're unfamiliar with, unless that's the purpose of the gathering, unless there's two tea bodies and you're coming together, hey, oh, let's try your tea, let's try my tea. But otherwise, always prepare tea you're familiar with so that you can prepare it well. So a tea that, um, that you know very well and you know how to prepare well. Um, and then, you know, it, but I don't... I think you, you can get stuck in, in patterns and always remember, brew this session. Every chashi is unique. Yi cha yi hui. One chance, one encounter. Every session is unique. And so what tea to prepare will depend on the weather. It will depend on the, the brewing method. It will depend on the guests and what whether we're going to be in a ceremonial setting or we're going to be in that connoisseur setting we're gonna, or the beverage setting. We're going to like, you know, we're here to appreciate tea and geek out on it. We're here to sit in ceremony. What kind of session is this going to be? What's the weather? Where are we at? 
what kind of people are coming, how many people, what type of teaware do I need, how do I prepare the tea the best, will depend on all of those factors. And so um, really it's about being really adaptable, highly adaptable. But in the beginning, especially if you're starting out, stick with teas that you're really familiar with so that as you get better at preparing them, that better at preparing them is something that you can also share with others, which is really, really cool. So, and you won't then, you'll find if, if again, the more practiced you are, and the more comfortable you are with that particular tea, the more you'll uh, be able to adapt to any situation that arises in any of the ceremonies. And sticking with a good tea that's delicious and has good energy and is simple and suits that time of day and that season. Um, so, you know, we, we, there's some other, uh, snow swept is a really good one that would, that's kind of like elevation and that it's, it's really good. Ruby red is also on the site. There's one called, um, cloud temple. Is that the green tea cloud temple? Cloud temple is, is really good. And we got a, another really bad green tea coming and maybe a, uh, unprocessed oolong as well that might come very soon, um, from master Yu San He. Uh, who we've written about in the magazines before. He's a beautiful tea master up in the north of Taiwan. And he, he has a red tea, uh, an unprocessed oolong, and a green tea. And I, we're, we've got the green tea already. We might get the red tea and the unprocessed tea as well. And those are also really wonderful for leaves in a bowl. Um, is there any other leaves in a bowl teas that are up right now that you can think of? Probably those ones. Yeah, those are, those are the main ones. Yeah, it's snow swept, though. This would be the next one that I think is would be the next to really good really really good choice if for, if you want a little bit more variety and if you've been serving too much elevation ruby red would be another one but a cloud temple would be another one but i think especially um snow swept so that's all these questions as uh, it's, it's a lot it took a long time i hope you found this uh discussion helpful and uh and rewarding and um you know that it inspired questions in you inspired you to ask more uh, and, and that you're left feeling more open-minded and inspired to explore and and uh, search and question. And um, that is a fuel for, for all of them for us to grow and share together. So I always invite you to view my teachings as invitations to explore, as as opportunities to question and think in different ways and and, and follow the journey where it leads. So I enjoy these questions, a lot of them out of the blue, including re amazing question, is, will humans drink tea on Mars? This was probably my favorite one of this session. So I don't have an answer, but I just am imagining a tea session on Mars is spread. So let's end with, with that, with a little bit of tea on Mars.